Uh, I'm not going, we have an hour and a half. Uh, I'm not going to uh, spend time reading the introductions for our panelists. You have them in front of you, and uh, it would take so long to read uh, what they've uh, done that uh, we use up a significant part of our uh, hour and a half. Uh, the um, two other panelists are Professor Arianto and uh, that's her guest too. I, I still call her Mary, but uh, and uh, I will say something at the uh, end. Uh, we'll go in the order that uh, they're listed in the program with uh, Professor Arianto going first. And the subject is uh, the business ecosystem in Indonesia. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Wells. Uh, good morning, everyone. Terima uh, kasih. Uh, especially thank uh, Jay and Anton for having me again here. And I will be talking about uh, trade and investment. Uh, Dr. Basi just mentioned this morning about this law, uh, which actually says uh, good times make uh, bad policy and bad times make good policy. <laughs> So I'm going to argue here that recently, unfortunately, Sadiq law is, is broken. <laughs> but to hedge against uh, the, this question, I put question mark now. So this is basically, uh, in large part, uh, is based on a recent paper I wrote with uh, my colleague in Indonesia, Samsura Harja. At that time, it was July. Uh, there was no question mark. Bad times make bad policy. Uh, but then after that, the government issues several uh, reform packages. So that explains the question mark there. Maybe then this law is back in the room, maybe not. So we can discuss. So that's our dear Pasadli <laughs> Almarhum. Uh, this is uh, people attributed this to Sadli's law, of course, to Pasadli. He was the uh, chair of BKPM, Investment Coordinating Board. He was the Minister of uh, Manpower, Minister of uh, Mine, for Mine, and of course, on top of all, he was uh, one of the greatest uh, UBI economists. And there are a lot of uh, references to this Sadlis law, uh, one of which I listed here with Hagil and uh, Almarhum Pate Jagwi. Bad times may produce good economic policies and good times the reverse. And if you look at the, back to the history, actually, Sadli's law was, uh, Sadli's law was confirmed. Uh, in the first session, we were talking about uh, Indonesia in the uh, Sukarno's era, command socialism in the 50s, in the 60s. But then there, come, there came good policies. For example, the economic reform by the new order of government, most notably of which is the uh, 1967 investment law. In the 80s, the oil price collapsed, and there was a series of uh, reform, uh, including trade cost cut, capital market, and banking sector development, and so forth. Uh, more recently, Asian financial crisis, I think, and we still remember, it was followed by a series of unilateral uh, liberalization. So it's half, right? But then it broke down uh, early in the uh, 2000. Uh, so we saw an interest in the free trade after the ASEAN financial crisis was actually short-lived. And even more recently, after the uh, GFC or uh, global financial crisis, we saw some uh, bad policy, quote unquote. Of course, there, 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 there were some good policies, but uh, more so for uh, bad policies. And most, uh, the, the most current one in the Jokowi government, we also see some uh, protectionist uh, measures, uh, even starting from uh, his campaign days. Uh, so these are just some list of those uh, threat protectionist uh, measures. And I will be talking also very quite briefly on investment. So recent laws, including uh, the uh, uh, mining law 2009, uh, horticulture law 2010, food law, trade law, industry law, uh, most recently the standardization law. If you scrutinize these laws, you will get the impression that these are, you know, basically uh, very much uh, protectionist uh, uh, measures. 
they restricted, they aim to stabilize domestic prices and to foster linkages between sectors, which, is, which can be very economically costly. And there are other characteristics of this, uh, a lot of common characteristics. For example, they often time contradict each other, and uh, they can be also in conflict with uh, bylaws or uh, PERDA, uh, as we know it in Indonesia. Uh, because the tariffs have been low in Indonesia, they take different forms, and most of which is non tariff measures, of course, including license, uh, labeling, uh, local content requirements, and, and, and export uh, restrictions. So this is uh, uh, historical uh, figures of uh, tariffs in Indonesia. You can see it has been going down. Uh, the standard, uh, the, the weighted one is below uh, 5%. Uh, so we're good uh, in, in, as far as tariffs is, uh, is concerned. But then they, uh, they take different form. As I said, it's non-tariff barriers. So there is this initiative called uh, GTA, or Global uh, Trade Alerts, that tracks the uh, trade measures uh, introduced by the member of G20s. And if you look at, uh, if you compare Indonesia with uh, other countries, and actually in their recent uh, uh, publication, they listed Indonesia as one of the worst offenders in terms of producing harmful uh, trade measures. Uh, we are comparable to China and India, for example, but if you look more closely, uh, most of our trade measures is on the non-tariff payers. And uh, those who took economics probably uh, still remember that non-tariff measures are more harmful than tariff measures because it's more uh, less transparent, so it's not easy to, to, to bring down like a tariff. And also from the same uh, initiative, you can see that well, the way they, they classify the trade measures, they have this code, uh, green, amber, and red. Uh, red being the most restrictive. And we can see that we have lots of reds there, uh, as identified this, by, by this global uh, red alerts. And if we try to see who are the most affected by our uh, trade measures, those are, well, most naturally, our trade partners, and China, US, and Japan. They do also uh, impose a trade restrictions, of course. So what I'm saying is that uh, even within the G20, there is this trade war, uh, which is basically uh, at the cost of the consumers, of so the members of the G20. And other uh, reference also uh, mentioned about the threat. Uh, protectionists in Indonesia just last week, or, or was this two weeks ago, from the Economist magazine. Uh, there is this article about uh, distortion in rice market, and you can see Indonesia is again juara satu, number one <laughs> there, right? So for all uh, uh, trend measures across the board, Indonesia has it. So uh, from tariffs, uh, import subsidies, all the way to import uh, restrictions. We are only second to India who does not in, impose the, uh, at the moment, import uh, restriction. So, we're the champion. <laughs> now FDI uh, and foreign direct investment, uh, there's been a, have a healthy uh, sum coming to Indonesia in terms of FDI. Uh, of course, uh, uh, just in 2014, it's more than 25 uh, billion, but in terms of per capita, it's quite small compared to, for example, Vietnam, Malaysia, and the, and the, and the in the Philippines and Thailand. Uh, but I was interested uh, in, uh, to uh, Dr. Bassi's presentation in the morning. He also mentioned about the importance of FDI. Uh, we probably prefer FDI. Well, of course, we prefer FDI compared to, for example, short-term capital inflow. But the question is, where do this capital inf uh, in, uh, inflow in terms of FDI uh, coming to, right? And in my research, recent research, uh, unfortunately, it not, it, they don't go to tradables. Uh, uh, so if you see, uh, oh, before we go there, uh, I, I, I should just mention also about the openness in the investment sector. There is another uh, index constructed by the World Bank. Zero means uh, very close to investment. 100 is very open. And you can see that Indonesia is actually quite open in terms of investment uh, compared to, for example, our neighbors, uh, neighboring the Philippines and Vietnam. But if you look at the 
uh, components. Uh, in the last, in the first session, we talk about the importance of human capital. Uh, I share that view. Uh, I think uh, improvement in human resources and human capital is very, very, very important and critical. But I'm hoping that Indonesia can also be like Malaysia and Vietnam in, in you know, inviting uh, investment on uh, education. So if you, but if you look at this, we are zero percent openness in, in terms of education. There are uh, foreign-based universities in Malaysia and in Vietnam, but not in Indonesia uh, right now. We're also very restrictive in media, but what I'm trying to uh, highlight there is in education, despite the fact that we really need improvement in human capital. Back on uh, to the investment where it goes to, as I argue, it, they don't go uh, to, to credible, and it's a cause of concern. Why? Because now that the countries in the region, uh, actually everywhere, the importance of global production network, regional production network is really important. And there is reason to believe that uh, actually the higher uh, foreign value added in your export means that you actually are part of this global production network. But as I looked at the Indonesian uh, input output, we, actually the, the foreign content in our export is decreasing, maybe because of all those protectionist measures. There is a side increase from 95 to, to 2000, meaning that we actually imported uh, raw materials and capital goods more for our export, but then it de keeps decreasing from 2000, 2005 to 2010. If you compare it to other countries, developing countries, uh, Taiwan and, and China and Vietnam, you can see it. Uh, uh, remarkable uh, differences. In Taiwan 2006, for example, their foreign content in their export is almost 50%, China 40%, almost 41%, Vietnam 40%, while in Indonesia it's less than 15%. So how do we expect that we, as in, in the first uh, session, we can graduate from, from resource-based to manufacture if we, this continues to be the case? So basically, what I'm arguing here is that all these protection measures actually uh, 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 prohibit uh, the investment to go to credible sectors, and that is uh, affecting uh, negatively to the economy. Now, we the question again. Uh, the, the question then is the why protection uh, emerges. There are standards explanation to this. Uh, Exchange rate protectionism, which it says that when the real uh, exchange rate appreciates, uh, the demand for protectionism, uh, the demand for protectionism uh, reduces, uh, and the other way around. Uh, but it does not explain why, for example, the government sometimes side with the uh, uh, smaller group of uh, producer at the cost of larger group of consumers. And there's uh, we borrow from political science. Uh, uh, literature, but much are also an uh, approach that of collective action. There's also an explanation about uh, drop in competitiveness, especially in the Indonesian case, our competitiveness is uh, very low compared to, for example, uh, China. And there is explanation about what we call the IMF trauma. I mean, many people still, still remember this picture of uh, Suharto signing the letter of intent and Michel Candesu is going like that, like Tom Pepinski now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it left a tr trauma in many, in many, many, not just Indonesia, uh, in fact, also in, in Korea uh, and other countries. Unfortunately, in Indonesia, it goes further to just not, not just IMF trauma, but foreign uh, entity trauma. Uh, and and, and then they, bring it, they bring this into threat policy and, uh, and investment policy against uh, uh, foreign or import content and, 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 and so forth. And another explanation, uh, you know, political science literature, it centers on the Jokowi uh, himself, Jokowi characteristics himself. Um, I remember I interviewed by Jokowi when he was still uh, the mayor of, of Solo. I was very impressed, and he was actually one of the uh, most success, successful mayor in, in Indonesia, he got all these awards, you know. Uh, and I was very impressed, he has this uh, business 
uh, instinct, a business sense. He was very market friendly. And, but then when he became the governor of Jakarta, he started to, well, probably, uh, well, to his credit, Solo is one tenth of Jakarta. And now Jakarta and uh, Indonesia is multiple fault of, of Jakarta. So the, the, the challenges is very, uh, is enormous. Uh, so, and if you look at the Pajokowi, uh, for example, there's this protectionist thoughts has already started since the campaign day. For example, he promised in his campaign to cut the uh, beef import from Australia. Unfortunately, he delivered that promise. When he became the president, one of the first things that pa Rahmat Gobel did was to cut the import quota to 80%. Australia created, you know, big tension uh, between the two countries. And then there is this demonstration and, and neighbor, neighborhood. Like what I mean by that, actually, not just Indonesia, but other countries are doing all these industrial policies and things like that. So Indonesia uh, policymakers might think that uh, we should do that too. Uh, so that's uh, some of the explanation why protectionism uh, emerged. So what are the challenges? Will, th will this trend of protectionism continue? Uh, well, if you look at the uh, RPGM, the national uh, uh, planning documents, you will see that there are some discussion about, uh, about trade and investment. But again, if you look at closely, they're mostly mercantilist in, 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 in nature. And so I don't think uh, in the near future that this will uh, uh, stop the calling for protectionism. And, but then, as I said, just recently, there's a, this series of, 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 of the regulations under uh, uh, Darmin. Uh, as a Menko, so, um, but I'm still reluctant to, to call this, you know, but to, to, to argue that the Sandy law is already back in the room because it's really uh, early to tell. Uh, it's all talk now, there's no implementation yet uh, so far, but I'm hoping that, that, that these are uh, good. Uh, there's reason for optimism. So there's now, I think, six packages already. Uh, if, just to, to give you some examples, so many verification, multiple verifications are no longer needed now. For example, for import of rice, wood, oil, and gas, you only need uh, some, uh, one verification by the custom. You don't need from a uh, survey, uh, what is surveyor in Indonesia. Uh, no need for other ministries' recommendation in terms of import for sugar, uh, salt, iron, or rice oil. These are just some, some examples. And also, there is streamlining of multiple documents in textile garments. Oh, there's reason for optimism. So finally, uh, uh, <laughs> I have hope. So from from Google to, to, to Tom Lembong, uh, again, this is too early to tell, but uh, oh yeah, he's Harvard. So I hope that's a good thing. Yes. So Tom said uh, in his first official interview with the Bloomberg TV, he says that actually this is a uh, uh, verbatim. Protectionist policies always backfire. So I took that as a good sign. And as a response to my recent paper, there is an article by Bush in 2015. He said that maybe good policies sometimes need a bit of bad policy. <laughs> I hope he's right. Thank you. Center Kennedy School uh, for organizing this. Uh, I have been now in North America for two months, and I'm finding there's very little attention on Indonesia and Southeast Asia. So, a thumbs up for you. And I would um, agree with our DCM's comment earlier that we hope that there will be more such uh, focused Indonesia events uh, in the near future because I think there's a lot of uh, understanding that needs to be done. Uh, I, uh, you will hear me present something that you don't normally hear uh, me present, which is on the creative economy. And I'm very glad that Jay asked me to uh, talk about the creative economy because it's kind of a relatively new concept. 
and it was something that I was given charge of uh, within the government, uh, I guess really for the last six years that we were in government. Uh, and it is related to the major questions that were being asked uh, today, which is if Indonesia has to diversify out of uh, primary uh, commodities, what are the new sources of growth? It's manufacturing, yes, uh, but creative economy also uh, is one of the answers. So let me, I, this, one? this one, this one, okay. So I wanted to uh, have three messages here. I wanted to put the context of why creative economy is important. And the fact that, you know, we know that there's a whole change in the world uh, in, in, in not just a post-global financial crisis, which I think our policymakers are not really uh, understanding, or even our economists fully understand. Uh, and that puts you in the picture of you know, what sectors should you be, or what kind of tasks should you be focusing on to develop in the near future for Indonesia, or countries like Indonesia, or other developing countries. And therefore, what policies do you need? So the policy reform question, we always come back to policy reform. So, uh, and then I will say something about creative economy, just because most people don't really understand what is the creative economy. Um, so first, the context. Uh, I think uh, from uh, Dede's presentation as well as Acha's presentation, we know that this is the reality, that Indonesia has to diversify, has to find new sources of growth and productivity and innovation. Now, uh, there was a paper recently uh, done by Aditya Matu. It's a working paper from the World Bank, and it's excellent. It talks about how the, the uh, structure of trade has changed post-global crisis. Basically, the growth of trade is now half of what uh, it was before the global financial crisis. So you're, you're talking about, OK, here's a crisis. We go back to normal, uh, and then we go back to business as usual. We have export-oriented strategy in manufacturing. No, it's, it's not, because there are structural changes happening that we have to be aware of. And basically, it's, it's new sources of trade growth that we have to look for. Uh, and obviously, the impact of China on Indonesia and the rest of the region has been very uh, massive. And China is going to do uh, structural reforms. Does this leave the labor-intensive production uh, open for countries like Indonesia, like uh, Vietnam, like Myanmar? Yes. But uh, we, we can't just have that. We have to go uh, forward. And the changing, I mean, the, the uh, underlying, it's it's, I won't uh, belabor the point, but just to emphasize that why, the, uh, why there has been a slowdown in goods trade. Part of the answer is what, uh, in, in this paper, they have all the evidence. It's the maturation of the global value chain, meaning that China used to import a lot of components and parts from other countries. But more and more, they are producing it all in China so that there's less trade. And, and they have all this evidence uh, to show that. So in other words, if you are thinking of the old production network export orientation kind of strategy, it's no longer uh, the answer. It's, it can still give you a few years, but that's not the way the world is going. That, that's kind of the message that I wanted to uh, play. And this is a, a, a graph that was taken from that paper to show that machinery and transport equipment is the old production network. and that's fallen because of the maturation of the, of the production networks. What has been resilient is services. Services trade has been resilient, and other goods. Other goods actually includes primary products. But of course, uh, beyond 2013, that's not going to be the answer either. This is just to uh, emphasize again the Indonesian story. The red is the raw materials, and it's all China-based. We had a contraction of 22% uh, of our exports to China. And this is just very briefly on global value chain. Uh, it's this, I'm not, this talk is not about global value chain, but if Indonesia and Indonesian policymakers do not fully understand about global value chain, then we don't quite know where our policy direction should be going. I think uh, Dede had it, uh, kind of mentioned this, that now it's not about what you should be focusing on. It's not uh, on, on a, I want to be an um, automotive uh, manufacturer. It should be on the capability and the task that go into making an automobile. And it's not just the parts and components, but it's also the services, the R&D, the innovation, the creative part uh, that goes into making an automobile. Which part do you want to be a part of? And uh, Ricardo Hausman, who's from this university, does a lot of work on this uh, capability. I'll just give you a few examples so it, it's real for you. Um, 
This is a, 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 from the WTO numbers that talk about value added. If you talk about iPod uh, and you look at China's imports of iPods to America, it looks like, uh, and how much they import in components, it looks like China has a huge trade surplus with um, the US. But in fact, if you input all the components, uh, China only makes $65 out of that value added. But what's more important is this picture. Uh, when you make an iPod, there's a lot of services that go into it, design and development, warehousing, distribution, not just the manufacturing. And, and that's part of the global value chain. And you haven't even talked about what goes inside the, the iPhone, the content and, uh, of the apps that go into the iPhone. And Indonesia uh, game makers are suppliers to uh, Apple iPhone. Uh, anybody know Infinite Sky? The young people may know. <laughs> it was the top 10 uh, games in Apple, uh, and it's made by an Indonesian. Okay? So, <laughs> uh, this is from Ricardo Hausman to show you uh, the different parts of the airplane. And Indonesia does make one part of it, the wingtip, right? Uh, in uh, PT, uh, PTPN. And this one, I want to show you this one because this is a creative industry example. And it's a real example based on our research uh, on, on one of the creative industries in Indonesia, animation. The blue ones are already made in Indonesia. The white ones are, are not yet. Uh, the, the highest value is in the pre-production, which is mainly Hollywood. It's the creation of the IP, the character that goes, you know, that, that's the, and the story and the script. That's the highest value. Uh, a country like Korea was like this 10 years ago. Now they have more blues, including in pre-production, including coming up with their own IP. But next time you see Garfield, 50% of that is being made in Batam Island in Indonesia, okay? So you want to be, country, so countries no longer specialize in goods. They should, the, the trend is you build clusters around a task. Okay, I want to be the best designer of uh, uh, mobile phones. Then I develop a cluster around that, including the schools, including the infrastructure, and so on. So if you want to export, you need to import, okay? When you, I think part of the way we see the policy makers or the media in Indonesia, okay, we want to reduce our current account deficit. We want to export, we want to increase export 300%, but we're going to limit imports, right? Doesn't work that way. Uh, <laughs> so it, openness is important not because of liber, liberalization and all that. It has to be an openness to people. I think they did mention this, outward and inward. You need talent if you want to be the best design center in the world, right? Okay, GVCs are, uh, also have the advantage of leapfrogging in, in, and, and uh, involving SMEs. Okay, I really wanted to get to the main part of my story, which is the creative economy. So is the creative economy uh, an answer? And what is the creative economy? This comes from, uh, what, when I started doing this, I didn't know there was such a thing as creative economy either, even though I'm an economist. But it turns out there's a whole literature and a whole, uh, a lot of people do research on this. And this is like, it's the fourth wave, they call it, okay? And I'm sorry, I have to, uh, we talked about this earlier. I usually uh, put this on the map, and I know all of you know how big Indonesia is and where it is, and that Indonesia is not part of Bali. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to emphasize that, you know, when we talk about natural resources or the resources of Indonesia, we, do, we never talk about the cultural resources. And even natural resources is not just coal and um, coal or uh, commodities. It's also your biodiversity. And this is all rich resources and capital for the creative industries as well as tourism and all that. This is the fourth wave. What is the difference between creative economy uh, and uh, knowledge economy or uh, innovation? Creative, very simply, creative economy is creating value uh, and sometimes very high value based on existing uh, knowledge, including uh, cultural heritage, and existing technology. You don't have to come up with anything new. It's just a, a new way of doing things or uh, leveraging on what you have and coming up with something totally new. I, actually, iPod is an example. iPod is not a new technology. It's three technology platforms that uh, somebody called Steve Jobs, a very creative person, saw the put it together and there's the iPod. I'll give you an Indonesian example, which is Batik. Batik, maybe 15 years ago, uh, all the Batik uh, pe uh, uh, people who work in Batik were dying and nobody's working in Batik. But then it, there was a revolution. Uh, actually, it was generated in a, in a warlike fashion 
the moment Malaysia decided that they wanted to <laughs> develop Batik, Indonesians got rallied together. Oh, we cannot do that. We cannot have that. Um, oh, that's kind of exaggerating. But there was a whole movement in Batik which is, um, you know, uh, uh, created a high value. Uh, and it's not just the kind of culture based; it's also the IT based. Okay. And so I was given this task six years ago by my president, who actually started it as he wanted to develop the handicrafts sector into more. Uh, more value, but then it spawned into 15 sectors, and it spawned into a, a ministry that was in charge of it. Uh, and some of it is arts culture based, some of it is science and technology based, but design is actually a very important component of the, of the creative industry. So it's, it's all you, what you think about, fashion and culinary and handicrafts, performing arts, but it's also the IT based games, architecture, design, and so on. Um, uh, and this is partly uh, for you, but also to, to explain to you. I, we came up with this only because when I was given this task in government, everybody thought, oh, yeah, yeah, she's just being given a toy to play with. This is not serious, um, you know. Uh, and then I decided maybe this, our economics training and our uh, evidence-based training, I said, okay, why is it important? Uh, and then I came up with all the, we came up with numbers, we came up with uh, the reason, and we, we showed how other countries have used it, like Korea. And I like to say that the, the um, result of all those years of work is being enjoyed by the current government and the current... <laughs> <laughs> three, uh, why, how do I measure my success? The budget went up three times, uh, not ten times, but from 150 million rupiah to one trillion. The, the new uh, creative uh, economic agency has one trillion rupiah budget, okay? And a second uh, evidence, it was one of the key uh, issues in the presidential debate. If those of you who watched the presidential debate, you will remember that scene. Uh, Prabowo crosses the scene to give uh, to shake uh, Jokowi's hand and said, "I agree with you on creative economy. My son is a fashion designer." You remember that? <laughs> okay, so that that kind of put it on the national level and the political level. So why is it important? Okay, this for economists, for all of you. I, I had to come up with this number, otherwise Babanas and um, Ministry, Minister of Finance doesn't take me seriously. <laughs> it's important. It contributes 7% of GDP, 10.7% of labor force, and almost 10% of companies. And you know, we have lots of numbers on exports and so on. Globally, uh, it's uh, $227 billion worth of exports, and it's mainly in design. And design is not like just fashion design, it's all kinds, product design, all kinds of design. That's kind of where the future is. Second reason why it's important, nation branding. You think this is fun uh, stuff, but it has value. The moment, you know, Korea, look at Korea. Korea is a good example. How they've been able to leverage what they've achieved with, tourism, with their um, creative products for tourism, for trade, for investment. And I actually, Derek may remember this, I actually assigned LPAM to do a study on the linkage between uh, tourism, trade, and investment, which comes first. And what was, I think you did it. Do you remember that? The causality of it. And because Malaysia was successful in using tourism uh, and, and so on. We wanted to know whether that was the case. Um, and it has value. Uh, uh, this is Batik and Tunnun and, and I'm sorry, I, I always do this show and tell. If, you, if all of you have seen this, um, this, you can see the scarf there. Why is this a, a good example of creative industry? Because I'm value added. Have I got it upside down? <laughs> Where's the head? <laughs> I'm not sure it's upside down. But it's it's a, a, a painting by Echo, uh, what is his last name? Echo Nugroho, uh, one of our most famous contemporary artists. And this has, he's already quite famous, but this is valuable because it's Louis Vuitton scarf, limited edition. And that shows you how value can be increased uh, in the case of creative industries. The, the corner there is an example of uh, decentralization and innovative, uh, innovative um, local governments. It's Banyuwangi Airport design uh, with uh, local architecture. Digital, we, digital uh, IT-based creativity is the future. And I think all countries, including the US, how does technology disruption create opportunities, create new business models? 
creates camp political camp how we do political cal political campaigns and the power of social media we all know indonesia is the the social media capital of the world right jakarta is the twitter capital of the world uh, and so on and we all know the story of how jokowi won the elections uh, partly because of social media and the, the role of uh, the role of uh, uh, creative people who were uh, had uh, millions of followers, and Jakarta governor governor uh, good, another good example who who posts all his meetings on on, on YouTube, uh, and I'm just going to go through quickly here just the, the potential of the uh, digital economy, e-commerce, and and so on, and mobile technology and connectivity, which is already happening in Indonesia, but we haven't leveraged the value for it. I'm just going to give you some examples of um, Indonesian um, Indonesian uh, creative IT-based products. Uh, we already talked about Infinite Sky. I just want to talk about this one because it's an interesting example <coughs> of cultural resources and IT-based creative industries. Uh, we all talk about how culturally diverse Indonesia is and the rich cultural resources. Even our ghosts are diverse. <laughs> we have the most ghosts compared to any other country. <laughs> serious, this is serious. Uh, each each, prop, each uh, region have their own ghosts, right? You guys only have Vampire and Dracula. <laughs> so this, uh, this, uh, this uh, very innovative young uh, company, they were doing uh, games for Japan and Korea, OEM. And one day they said, we want to make our own games. So they came up with this ghost uh, from all over Indonesia. And they came up with a game called Dread Out. And it is uh, already uh, a hit on Steam. <coughs> Steam is the, the platform that you have to make it to, to make sure that your game is international. And they have 9 million followers, and they raise money from uh, crowdsourcing. Another example, 99design is a platform for logo design uh, created by a young Australian. And they have 129,000 registered Indonesian designers on that platform. And they, and they are all from all over Indonesia. They're not in Jakarta. They are actually in uh, villages all over Indonesia. Usually I show you the film, but I don't have time to show you the film. But the, this, um, we did a documentary on this. Uh, Salaman District near Magelang. It's basically uh, farmers during the day, tukang batu during the day. At night, they taught themselves how to do design logo, and they have been able to increase their income uh, uh, from 200 to 2,000 US dollars per month from 100 US dollars per month. Self-taught from the computer, and anything's possible. They don't speak English, they use Google Translate. Uh, and and uh, they, they, the crime rate has reduced because they're so busy at night uh, and, and drunkenness has been reduced because at night they're all busy uh, designing logos and earning money. Okay, so conclusion, um, uh, we, are, uh, we have to change, we have to be open and access to technology, access to uh, talent is important. So when you talk about industrialization policy today, it should not be, we want to make every, the industrial tree, which is actually embedded in the industrial law, <laughs> uh, it's not really the way to go for the future. Uh, it's, it's, you know, can't produce everything. Local content focus is also not the way to go. It should be how to be competitive around a task or a cluster that will go around the task. And that includes uh, institutions in there. And of course, this, this whole session is tied, uh, titled uh, Business Ecosystem, is that right? How do you have a healthy ecosystem um, that uh, you can get the input, you can get the people, you can get the technology, financing, market, uh, and so on. And this is, I, this is, we did, you know, maybe because of my background, we actually did a a research for one year involving hundreds of people and in involving the 15 communities. Mm -hmm. This is the conclusion of it. That we did a sectoral study on every one of them and we have value chain and mapping uh, on, on all those 15 sectors. And this was the seven strategic issues that they came up with as a conclusion. If you wanted to develop the creative industries in Indonesia, you'd have to address these seven strategic issues. And each sector have a different uh, priority on the strategic issues. Human resources, education, creative talent, and skills. So this, and it's not just about the long-term education. It's the short-term education, the training, and so on. Creative resources. 
natural resources, having a database on, 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 your, on your resources. If you run out of ratar, what's the alternative to ratar? Or what are the alternative? We have so many uh, choices. Cultural. <coughs> this is the inspiration for um, creative products. How do you grow the industry and the business? Financial. Financial, you, we don't have venture capitalists or angel investors in Indonesia. How do you grow that? Access to markets and networks. It's quite different from uh, goods, and each one of them have their different uh, characteristics. You want to be in the game industry, you have to be on Steam. Uh, you want to be in fashion, you have to be in certain fashion shows, etc., etc. Supporting infrastructure and technology. Uh, ICT technology is very important, not just the physical. Access to technology, um, hopefully at a low cost. Can you have Microsoft uh, 3M and all that give you access to design technology at, at a lower cost? Uh, and here is, I wanted to just mention one word on cities, the, the role of, de of uh, decentralization and the role of mayor, inno innovative mayors and cities. A lot of creative industries in, in other parts of the world, they grow at local level, at city level. And here is where a lot of city governments, uh, local governments have actually taken off with creative economy in, in a big way including Solo, okay? Solo was one of my uh, also uh, examples of success. And then obviously institutions, laws, regulations, especially on IPR uh, and active participation in, in interna international fora. And I think openness at the end of the day uh, for all this. So um, I know that we, my final point, because I do want to say this on, on policy reforms, uh, I think there's a dis... dis <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there is a dysfunction between how the, even the economists or the policymakers are thinking about deregulation and reforms and where, where you want to take Indonesia in terms of competitiveness, innovation, and creativity. And this is, I think, uh, uh, you know, the, what we talked about earlier about nationalistic tendencies and inward looking. Uh, so the question uh, for all of you is, is the deregulation packages and current reforms, even though you put a question mark on it even then. Uh, is it enough? Are we going, uh, what was the word you used, transformative enough or not? Or are we just being reactive, you know? Or are we just, you know, we're going, okay, export orientation, manufacturing, debureaucratization, reduce red tape, we're doing that. But we actually did that in 2004 to 2010, and then it got rolled back. So we're actually just removing what was the creeping protectionism that came about uh, in the last few years. Uh, it goes, needs to go deeper than that, and how much deeper do we need to go for that, especially to encourage uh, reforms. You know, we talk about innovation and R&D and human capital. So getting the ecosystem right is the challenge, and that requires deeper uh, reforms, including changing some of your laws and changing some of your institutions, and most importantly, and the hardest of all, changing the mindset of the bureaucracy. Okay, I'll, I'll stand, stop on that. I was told to talk about doing business in Indonesia, which I think is a rather broad uh, topic for 15 minutes. So uh, I decided on my own to uh, limit it to um, an overview of policies toward foreign direct investment in uh, Indonesia. Uh, one advantage of being a senior speaker, not quite as senior as Dwight, I uh, was in, in Indonesia first in 1969, so you uh, beat me there. Uh, is that uh, one tends to look at long-term patterns and perhaps get a little less caught up in uh, new policies uh, that, to me, are often repeats of what happened uh, before. So I do want to put some of the current concerns into uh, a longer-term uh, context because I think some individual steps get uh, taken as indicating a change in uh, attitudes toward foreign direct investment, which I think is a misreading of uh, what's actually happened. I, I want to spend my uh, time on three, three topics. Um, what's the same? And I think a lot is the same. Uh, what is actually different? And I think one thing is actually different. Uh, and third, what looks different, but may really not be different. 
the message at the end will be relaxed, uh, that things haven't changed all that much, although if I were in a business that were, that was affected by a, a policy step now, I might be very concerned. But uh, overall, I think the uh, policy changes have been much less than, uh, than uh, one might suspect from uh, uh, announcements and publicity about some steps taken. Uh, what's the same? Um, all through the Suharto period, uh, there was tension over foreign direct investment uh, or openness uh, to uh, the world. It was a little bit easier in those days to classify ministries by uh, their stance. Uh, different people had different labels, but uh, you had the technocrats, uh, the Murphy Mafia, whatever name you wanted to use, who favored an open economy and uh, a welcome to foreign direct investment. Uh, sometimes, depending on uh, the individual uh, incentives for foreign direct investment. And you had uh, an, another side, which often uh, is represented by particular ministries, that different people had different labels for. Uh, one was the engineers. Uh, they weren't all engineers, but uh, they often got labeled that way. Uh, often uh, allied with uh, local business, purely domestic business. Uh, which had an attitude of protecting local firms, uh, often protecting them from foreign uh, direct investment, uh, as well as protecting them from imports. Uh, this was represented with tariffs and licenses, but also an approval process, which I think delayed approvals very often uh, in order to see whether domestic industry organized opposition to the foreign investor. Uh, if it didn't organize uh, strong opposition to the foreign investor, uh, the approval went through. Now, this was never a state of policy, but I think that is, in practice, uh, what happened. Uh, all during that, I, I think that tension still exists, although it may be a little harder now to label uh, individuals as clearly as you could in those days. And I think that tension resulted in shifts in nominal policies uh, during the Zarto period, and I think it still does. Uh, one sees new policies that discourage foreign investment, and then one sees new policies that encourage foreign investment. And it's tempting to think the whole attitude toward foreign investment has changed when some of those negative ones appear, or that there's been a big shift in favor uh, when the, uh, uh, less, the more favorable ones appear. Um, one encouraging thing, I think, is that uh, many of the policies that were negative toward foreign investment, and this is continued, actually didn't get enforced. Uh, you know, in some of the examples, uh, every once in a while there's a move toward requiring domestic ownership. And yes, it, you know, some firms do have to respond to it, but in many cases, uh, foreign investors have escaped uh, the requirement of serious local ownership when um, they uh, felt very strongly about it and fought. Uh, a more recent policy that's gotten publicity is requiring the, the um, raw materials being exported that they be processed domestically. Uh, in fact, there's nothing new about this. Uh, I remember spending some time in Jakarta looking at restrictions on leather exports. Uh, it was certainly 20 years ago. I suspect it was 30 years ago when I was looking at it. Uh, the uh, Current policy of requiring uh, processing of minerals doesn't seem all that uh, new to me. Uh, Freeport saw, uh, was under this constraint for a long time. Uh, did construct a small smelter. Uh, pressure relaxed, and then pressure came back. Um, again, I think it's uh, not a huge change. Uh, same with incentives. Uh, tax incentives were there. They disappeared came back, they declined, they increased, 
Uh, it's the same uh, reflection, I think, of uh, the shifting influence of um, uh, essentially the same old ideologies that conflicted in the uh, past. Uh, sometimes it looks like Indonesia can't decide. I, I think it's not that it can't decide. I think it's just uh, some uh, slight shifts in, uh, in power balance uh, from time to time. Uh, what is different? Uh, and I think uh, uh, Professor Kropinski uh, was right that decentralization uh, has had an impact on uh, foreign investment. Uh, the hopeful view of decentralization of approval processes, uh, granting of uh, mineral concessions and so on to local entities was that the local entities would compete for foreign investment. Uh, that was not the first response. You know, it was the first response in some other countries. But I think there were reasons why this was not the first response in Indonesia, and that is the local governments tended to view themselves, before they got more power, as serving the central government. Their route to promotion was to Jakarta. Uh, officials didn't owe their loyalty to the local community to the extent that they did in some other countries. I think that's changing. And now we're beginning to see uh, one of the uh, hoped for benefits of decentralization. Uh, so I think that should be encouraging to foreign investor, the foreign investors, but there are still problems with the decentralization that plague foreign investors in Indonesia. Uh, first, it's often seen as another layer of approval, not as a substitute for uh, the previous level of approval. Uh, it's often seen, and I think probably correctly, as another hand reaching out for corruption for payments. Uh, and uh, it may have been an inevitable result of shifting some of the approval process to the local government. Uh, local officials saw an opportunity that was only in Jakarta before, or mainly in Jakarta. Uh, and fourth, uh, and probably related to corruption, but uh, perhaps to less competence at the lower level than at the central level, is the handing out of uh, overlapping um, concessions, where um, two or three companies get uh, uh, rights to minerals in the same area, and it's unclear who's right uh, uh, rules. And uh, in fact, some of these are, are going to arbitration internationally because of this. And I think it's at least partly a result of the decentralization. I think this makes um, it's not a change in policy toward foreign investment, but it makes foreign investors' uh, life doing business in Indonesia sometimes more difficult, not always easier. Uh, what looks different, but I think may not be all that different. Uh, it's gotten a lot of publicity in the business community uh, here recently, and that is Indonesia renouncing uh, its bilateral investment treaties. Uh, as many of you know, uh, bilateral investment treaties uh, are seen as providing protection to investors and providing protection particularly in, needed in countries with legal, uh, weak legal systems. Uh, Indonesia is seen, again, probably correctly, as having a weak uh, judicial system. Uh, so to investors, the investment treaties are more important than they would be in uh, in many other countries. Uh, Indonesia uh, fairly recently renounced its uh, investment treaty with the Netherlands, that was the first one, and has now taken the step of renouncing its investment treaties with several other countries. Uh, investors worry that this is a uh, sign of um, turning against foreign direct investment. I think they're dead wrong to view it that way. That Indonesia has not renounced all of its treaties. Uh, in fact, uh, investors can still get coverage under uh, ASEAN or AFTA, uh, whether you're a treaty for yeah. uh, They still get coverage under, I never can remember the name of it, is it OCI, the uh, 
OIC. Okay. What does this stand for? No, no. Uh, it's the uh, Islamic. Um, uh, yeah. Cooperation Conference. OCC. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and there's still some other uh, investment treaties that uh, are in effect. Uh, Indonesia really hasn't said uh, that it's renouncing the principle of investment treaties. Uh, it has, some officials have said they do want investment treaties, but they want to renegotiate the terms. And I think it's some bad experiences with investment treaties some very bad experiences uh, that have led Indonesia to this position, and they're not alone. Uh, a number of other countries have similarly taken steps to renounce their investment treaties and to try to negotiate uh, new ones. Uh, the, I think some, so a couple of experiences in particular uh, led Indonesia to be concerned about the terms of its existing treaties. Uh, one was um, some awards with the earlier, with respect to the uh, electric power agreements, where investors who had not even started their business yet uh, were awarded uh, three times what they claimed to have invested, uh, much less what they had actually invested, which was uh, probably considerably less. Uh, this was viewed as unfair and costly to Indonesia. And a recent case where it's been shown uh, that the documents that uh, the investor was using to base his claims on were forged documents, and this wasn't, was not immediately thrown out by the, the case was not immediately thrown out by the tribunal. That upset Indonesians, and I think appropriately so. Uh, Indonesia has said that it's interested in joining the uh, Trans-Pacific Agreement, which has investment provisions that are very similar to um, other uh, investment uh, to what's in the bilateral investment treaties. Uh, surely we're uh, so concerned about the existence of these uh, provisions that did not indicate its willingness or interest in joining. So I think this is something that is exciting investors right now and I think uh, unnecessarily uh, doing so. Um, I think there are real problems for investors in Indonesia, but they're all problems. Uh, that is, uh, corruption is a difficult uh, issue, issue for foreign investors. Uh, the weakness in infrastructure uh, is, discourages foreign investment, and especially foreign investors that uh, come to Indonesia to manufacture for export. The um, exchange rate, which um, has been probably overvalued uh, for particularly of concern to investors manufacturing for export, I think is a real issue. But I think there are real opportunities for exactly these investors. Uh, the firms that go abroad for sourcing uh, inputs or um, final products are becoming a little uh, discouraged with China. Uh, there used to be a policy in most of these firms never source more than 50% of your products from one uh, source. Uh, they backed off of that when China seems so attractive and, and costs seem so low. Uh, they're beginning to rethink that backing off, going back to looking for uh, diversity in sources. China's become more costly. I think Indonesia now has a, another chance to capture uh, some of these uh, investors. Um, this does mean, of course, the need for some policy changes and for development of uh, infrastructure. Uh, I think we're open now for questions. Yes? Uh, my question is, listening to your, listening to your presentation, I'm, I'm optimistic, but also pessimistic now. <laughs> I'm optimistic about the, the opportunities, but it seems to me that the product cycle is getting shorter and shorter because of this, you know, this, this kind of innovation. Then uh, my question is, what is the role of the government? Because I don't think government can catch up at any time with the innovation which is happening in the creative industry. 
and there is a tendency now to bring the government back. If you look at the policy using the state-owned enterprise, emphasizing on the state-owned enterprise, seems to me that the current deregulation is not sort of like focusing to address this issue. And if you look at on this, you know, the creative industry, seems to me that will be very difficult for the government to play a role because the regulation definitely cannot catch up with the innovation. So, so I would like to hear your view on this. What will be the role of the government on this? Good question. Uh, when I was started doing creative economy uh, for the government, uh, <laughs> I was uh, facing a lot of suspicion by all the creative communities. They said, "What's the government trying to do to us now? You know, <laughs> stay away. We're fine without government. You know, uh, with the moment government intervenes, we're gonna. You know, we don't want to be controlled. We don't want to be intervened because you know, creative people tend to be uh, tend to be like that." Uh, and in fact, uh, having a democracy is very important for creative economies to grow because it's the freedom of expression and so on. Uh, and then when we, you know, we continue to talk to them, and it turns out that they do still need the government for certain things, like infrastructure, for instance. I mean, the ICT infrastructure has to be the number one, apart from the ports and uh, and roads and so on. I think ICT infrastructure. Uh, is very key. You can see the kampung, uh, my designer kampung example, how uh, a village in Magalang can re increase its um, income and reduce poverty, create employment, uh, because of their ability to uh, access the world market from where they are. You know, they don't have to move, and it, it reduces uh, rural-urban migration also. But we, we, I think we're just still touching the surface of this potential. Uh, it, I think um, Pa Arto mentioned in his opening remarks that there's this idea to increase e-commerce by 10 times in Indonesia. I mean, e-commerce is another opportunity for uh, isolated parts of Indonesia to be, you know, when we talk about, remember we always talk about domestic integration in Indonesia, it's, we always talk about it in the physical infrastructure sense, but I think in the kind of the ICT, the payment system, the financial system that, and telecommunication system that must underlie something like an e-commerce that will allow uh, farmers or anybody from anywhere to be selling domestically and internationally is another big opportunity. Uh, so the government has to get the infrastructure right and the regulations right for this to happen. Uh, something like e-commerce, which is a big debate for Indonesia right now. How much should you control? How much should you regulate? Versus how much should you let it let it uh, let one thousand flowers bloom? Just because I think the regulations will never catch up with the way things happen. I, I, they have debate of the same issues in in the U.S. By the way, it's because it's it's a it's moving so fast. Yeah, but the moment the government tries to regulate it, um, then it dies. <laughs> yeah, uh, which is the, this was part of your bad, what is it, bad times, bad policy. One of, I mean, my um, former ministry, Ministry of Trade, uh, they were they had a, a version of the e-commerce regulations which would have killed e-commerce. That's what I was told by the e-commerce people. I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit. I can say that no, I'm, I'm not in government. <laughs> uh, but then, uh, under the new ministry, uh, they they know that there, this is an issue. This is a problem. Maybe just let it be because you don't know where it's, where it's going. That kind of thing. The other thing the government can do is education. And I would say, if you want to be the best creative hub for something allow the foreign talent to come in. Don't require them to speak Bahasa Indonesia. Even if they don't speak Bahasa Indonesia, they should be allowed to come. You know, Allow openness of ideas, technology, talent. Uh, and infra uh, infrastructure also includes things like building theaters, building, uh, and that can be at the city level. Uh, I think uh, if you read the literature on how creative economy and innovation happens, a lot of it happens at the local level, at the city level. So urban uh, smart cities, this is the, the thing of the future, smart and livable and creative cities, uh, and that's decentralization and letting the, the, the local governments have the commitment. I think without local government commitment also cannot happen. Oh, IPR protection is, is the last one, which is very important. Hi, uh, so I want to ask you a question to uh, Acho and Mumari, which sort of joined your two, um, your two presentations. And so 
I was struck by the two most closed sectors being education and media, and those being the key sectors for the creative economy. And so uh, I wonder if there is a possibility. So first off, do you see any possibility of opening in uh, uh, to sort of more foreign interaction? I think your comments just suggest that that would be valuable. Is this politically possible? And second off, I mean, just a reflection is that I find Indonesians to be the most, the amount of creativity involved in Indonesia already is is immense, and it's directed towards non-value-added things like coaching, right? So being creative in solving a, uh, an infrastructure problem or a market failure rather than creativity in, in generating value. So I wonder if that's the sort of debate that, that ever happens. Well, that's difficult, Tom. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I can answer that, but I remember when Ibu Maril was still the Minister of Trade, I was part of this research team to look at the possibility of opening up of four service sectors, uh, health, infrastructure, education, and what's the, uh, the other one? Agriculture, probably. No, uh, surface, 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 distribution. And we came up with a policy recommendation, of course, in favor of opening up uh, education and health. And there was a lot of resistance, including from associations. So ED, Ikatan Doctor Indonesia, it's the Indonesian Medical Doctors Association, was strongly against uh, the idea of opening up uh, health uh, sector in Indonesia. Even education, uh, you know, people from education sector said that, no, we, we, we don't want uh, Monash to uh, build uh, uh, university in Indonesia like, a, like what they did in Malaysia, for example. We can teach our own students. So things like that. And it's been a while, but I don't see any uh, significant remarks against uh, uh, significant uh, 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 change uh, possible in the near future, given the rhetorics of, of, the, of the government now. But I'm really not sure what's going to happen in, in, in the next time. I mean, there is this embrace to uh, TPP, for example, RSF, uh, even AAC, ASEAN Economic uh, Community. If they really comply with all of this, sooner or later, they, they're going to have to do some opening up of, of, of these sectors. But again, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I fought a long time on this issue, and I've lost it. <laughs> I mean, I, I was, in, you know, as Minister of Trade, we were in charge of coordinating um, a negative list on investment and uh, also the uh, services negotiations. And on, on education, we fought, but we lost. They, they actually have a 49% limit in the law, in the education law. So it's a little bit hard uh, to, to overcome that. Um, Although I would think that education, health, because it's human capital related, we used to always argue you need to have, you need to open up the education and health sector because it's going to help the development of your human capital. And we even had estimates how much Indonesians were spending on health abroad. It's, it's a huge number. It's $400 million a year. Now, that's a huge number. So, you know, we, we make all these arguments, but unfortunately, I think I remember uh, Forum Rector came and protested to me many times uh, not to open up. So what's the solution? I think it gets to the question that was asked in the first session. How do you institutionalize reforms? How can you get reforms? How can you get... These are questions that we, we, we faced every day for 10 years. And one of the answers is perhaps, uh, given Indonesia's situation, you, you, if you can't change the whole country, do a special economic zones do islands of best practices and that's what we've tried to do so um can you can you have a special economic zone for free uh, for open education for foreign investment i think technically and, uh, and by the reg regulation you can uh, it's whether you're willing to do it or not and maybe you can start by even like media and education as long as it's 100 percent export it's not going to affect your you know domestic situation and then eventually this is because in a model obviously you get people comfortable with the idea and, and not be so scared about it. Uh, and it, you know, that's what I'm trying to recommend that uh, for the media, you know, if you want to be a film company, uh, which is now in the prohibited, you can if you are in the special economic zone. And then, you, and then that will still grow the talent and invite talent to come. So that would be, that's actually one of my recommendations right now. There was a hand up in the back. Uh, 
Um, I'm Taufan from Harvard Kennedy School. Um, since we talk about uh, giants, so I try to compare Indonesia with China and India. Uh, we know that the amount, the amount of investments uh, in, in India and China uh, are more uh, India and China are more op optimistic foreign investment bet uh, than Indonesia. And I mean, for for examples, uh, 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 if we uh, see, uh, if we talk about impact investings, uh, there are more uh, companies in India uh, that get investments uh, from Europe and US. If you talk about uh, tech entrepreneurships, there are many more uh, high value, um, uh, high valuations uh, uh, tech startups in India and China than Indonesia. And if you talk about uh, creative economy, media, uh, uh, entertainments, uh, there are more movie produced in India and China, but not uh, in Indonesia. <laughs> And um, yeah, if we uh, uh, for uh, Bu Mari Pangestu, uh, from your uh, experience as a uh, former minister, what what can we uh, learn from uh, India and China in terms of uh, their uh, uh, their way to attract, attract more investments, and what can we adopt uh, from their experience to Indonesia? Um, and for Professor uh, Wells. Um, yeah, is there any uh, specific countries that is relevant with uh, current Indonesia economic uh, situations that how we can uh, attract more uh, investment and uh, I mean for countries specific any uh, samples that uh, we can learn from them for our governments? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, you asked three different sectors: IT and film. I think was it. IT, film, and media. Well, they each have different stories. So very briefly, uh, India and India succeeded in IT because of its diaspora, uh, bringing back uh, a lot of the um, uh, links and the, and the capital. And also, they have a much stronger human capital on the engineering and the coding, uh, similarly with China. Uh, and China, of course, they succeeded because they didn't let Google and <laughs> Microsoft and um, uh, Facebook in, so they, they grew their own uh, IT, right? Uh, Indonesia, of course, uh, one of its weaknesses, and this I got uh, uh, this feedback from a lot of the, uh, what do you call those people, uh, venture capitals and angel investors who started coming to Indonesia. Indonesia does not have the, the strong engineering and coding uh, uh, people, people who can do coding and engineering, because once you have a good idea, you have a uh, something that uh, has begins to have traction. The moment you want to scale it up, you need a, a whole system behind it, which Indonesia at the moment doesn't have uh, the capability. For film um, and media, uh, India has a huge domestic market because it has a lot of cinemas. Uh, they have maybe 1,000 times more cinemas than Indonesia. Uh, so that explains there's a market there. Indonesia, the Indonesia only has 800 this is really sad. 800 screens for the whole country. Do you know that? And maybe 80% of that is in Jakarta. And part of that is related to the past when you had uh, the, the cinema, the, the major cinema used to be the monopoly, etc., etc. And then after that, uh, nobody really invested in cinemas and it got overtaken by bad cinetrons in on local TV. <laughs> uh, and uh, China has. I don't know why, Ch I don't, this is a good question for all of you who are China experts. China has a quota on film imports. I don't know how they got away with that in the WTO accession. There are, you can only import 34 uh, Chinese uh, foreign films into China every year. And uh, so they have, a, what do you call it, uh, affirmative action. And also the t television stations uh, have to play 55%, uh, I think it is, uh, local, locally produced uh, uh, TV. So Indonesia, I, we when was that when we got hit on the head by the U.S. It was actually in the 80s, I think. We, we used to have film quota import, import, but we the U.S. came and said you can't do that, and we, <laughs> we gave in. <laughs> we were not good at negotiations, obviously. And the interesting thing about China: 34 uh, films that can be imported. But out of the 34 films, if you produce any part of it in China it's considered as imported film. That's why Warner Brothers and all that, they're setting up uh, production in China. 
right? So uh, these are affirmative action. I don't know what Indonesia can learn uh, from all that because we, there's a lot we can't do. But cinemas, at least, uh, maybe put it in, put it out of the negative list, right? For foreigners to come in, that's one way, etc., uh, etc. Et we can we can think about the policies for Indonesia. You know, India is interesting as a comparison because India had very little U.S. investment until the diaspora emerged. And I think the diaspora itself is partly a product of the uh, very high quality technical institutes in India, which prepared uh, graduates very well for entry into U.S. graduate schools, uh, which is a source of a large part of that diaspora that then returned to India, not necessarily to invest itself, but to in technical firms here to source uh, uh, skills out of uh, India and establish um, call centers first and then uh, manufacturing there. Uh, India, was, India was known in the US, but not like China. Uh, China is, has long been important to the US as a trading partner, it was a disruption of uh, the post-war war, post the post-Second World War period. That was the oddity. Uh, Boston has a museum to, or had uh, a museum to the American-China trade. There's no museum to the America-Indonesia trade. Uh, families here, uh, many of them, there are a lot of families here who had a mem family member as a missionary in China. Uh, for a generation a little older than me, uh, there were a lot of Americans that fought in China uh, in the Second World War. China is just much better known to Americans than uh, is Indonesia. Uh, and American firms, I think, were eager to go to China as soon as it opened up again to foreign direct investment, even though it opened up uh, in the special uh, zones and initially allowing investment only for uh, export. But they always wanted the China market. And what does it mean for Indonesia? I think it means that uh, investment promotion is much more important for Indonesia than it is for China. China was never very active here from, uh, with investment promotion. It didn't have to be. Some of, some of the provinces were, eventually, but not uh, China as a uh, investment promotion agency. Uh, India wasn't uh, well known here for investment promotion. Uh, it was a diaspora. Without either being well known or having the diaspora, I think there's a, there is a need for investment promotion and simply Indonesia promotion that uh, didn't apply to uh, China and India. Uh, it's a skill, it's a marketing skill that's very hard to incorporate into a bureaucracy. Uh, and especially into a bureaucracy that's used to controlling, not not um, promoting. But I think uh, there's a big payoff for Indonesia in developing an effective investment promotion activity. But India was right. Just let Indonesian students stay for a while abroad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, in fact, Indonesia would probably be better off if more did stay abroad. Indonesians have a reputation of going back home. Uh, more stayed here uh, and then uh, went back later. I think. Be good. A lot of students here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> We're happy to have you stay. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm sorry. I forgot. I was responding to Jeff's question. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Yeah. Hello. Um, my name is Dimas. I'm from uh, New York University. Um, I think it's really interesting uh, to see, like um, um, Tom mentioned, um, the IT industry and how India get. Uh, I don't know. It's. I think it's, it's uh, um, arguable uh, whether it's a uh, India has more foreign investment or not, but I think, I mean, I've been living for um, outside Indonesia for uh, six, seven years and working in IT industry, and I have met like maybe more Indians <laughs> than the uh, other um, compared to the local um, Americans or, or Japan when I was working in Japan, and I saw that um, India has the tendency of, um, so they have like a very uh, global-minded um, talents. So uh, uh, Bumari uh, mentioned about the the the, the 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 importance of having um, the diversity of international talents. You want to build the top R&D um, institutions in Indonesia. You have to 
you, there's no op other options. You have to have the best um, talents in Indonesia, and and to be to be able to accelerate that, um, I see India has, um, as mentioned also, um, have a dias diaspora, um, the, the large community of diasporas, uh, like maybe almost uh, twenty percent of, of uh, Google's in engineers are now is is, is Indian, so. I see that um, Indonesia, in this in the sense, uh, sounds, it's 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 sad to see that um, not so many um, um, recent graduates or students have the the uh, long term uh, dreams or plans to be able to to, uh, to to jump in into the industry and absorb the knowledge and 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 everything that is needed to build an industry in Indonesia and then go back and then start to build um, the, the, their their own startups. So. I think most of the Indonesian people have that kind of I don't know like like uh, nationalistic feeling when when they have uh, graduated and then they they started to go back and to Indonesia and and, and not um, trying to push themselves to, to jump into the industry and then and then learn from 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 developed countries. So my my question is that um, so we see India uh, has have been um, trying to 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 um, to. To do that, it's exactly that that path. Um, they, they are trying to uh, export their their talents, and then um, um, and then some majority of, of, of Indian people, whether they, they stay or they go back to India, to India and then then build their own um, industry. Or we, we we also see that there there is also a, an example of China, which is basically they their their policy is basically to 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 control their own um, uh, in the um, IT economy, and then. Try to block like Microsoft, Google, and Facebook uh, to, to to enter China. So my question to Bumari is that um, I wonder. Uh, so I would like to hear your view on on which uh, way, whether it's more if we, which Indonesia, which uh, which way, uh, which is. So there's an Indian way I, I would call, it, and there's a Chinese Ch Chinese way. So uh, which is more um, suitable for for Indonesia for growing forward? Thank you. That's a hard one to answer, but uh, I'll share you my thoughts and my ideas, which I was never able to implement fully. I think uh, we, we, it's neither India or Indonesia or China. I think for Indonesia, one thing is clear: we do we do need to increase the capability, the engineering and the coding capability. So I think coding is something. It's not a long-term training, right? If I'm not mistaken. To do coding, you can do a six month or one year training. So I think if, and that's short term, which can yield a lot of uh, impact. So if we, if we could have funding to do that and do that in, in large numbers, I think that would help to be the backbone uh, for any, because it will, it will grow. I mean, Indonesia is right at the beginning of this process and it will grow. Uh, second, how do you create captive demand uh, if it's not natural demand? I think the captive demand can come from government. I, I actually tried this in 2006 when I was still in government, but unfortunately, for many reasons, part of it nationalistic reactions, uh, <laughs> I, I, I did not succeed. And I was with Sofian Jalil at, at that time. We tried to invite Microsoft because we were trying to copy Egyptian model where e-government provides you captive demand for growing your IT-based industries. And this is what Egypt did. Uh, the, the, the guy who became prime minister, uh, I forgot his name, but the tall guy, who he, he was actually the cabinet secretary in charge of uh, e-government in Egypt. And then he invited anchor tenants like uh, Microsoft, and then they created this uh, kind of technology park, subsidized the uh, interconnection rate, and uh, asked the anchor tenants to involve and train smaller uh, local indigenous companies to service the government's e-government needs. Because that's captive market, and it doesn't violate any WTO regulation because we are not a signatory to the government procurement <laughs> agreement. So we can specify it has to be local, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So that would be, that I think that I still think maybe at the city level, uh, at the local government level, this can happen, and it's already happening. I think uh, Jakarta and Surabaya, uh, even solo, maybe they're doing, you know, trying to grow the local companies to service the the needs of the government. Uh, finally, uh, the whole ecosystem for IT is still not uh, good. It's the IPR issue. It's the e-commerce regulations. It's, 
you know, to become a company in America, all you have to do is go to the website and L is it LCC? Is that what they're called? You just register yourself. Yeah. In Indonesia, you still have to go. Even if you're a small little company, you still have to go through all the the process. Registration was another fight we had, which we did not succeed. I don't know, BKPM succeeded or not. To have just registration for small companies, just register enough. No need to go through all the uh, process like you do uh, in, in, in to set up a company. Because that was another complaint we got uh, from many of the startups. They don't know, you know, all these regulations uh, that are very complicated. Uh, maybe that's a short answer for your. It, it can. It's a, quite a long answer, but. Uh, that's what I can give you at the moment. I think you're a little optimistic about how easy it is in the U.S. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, every moderator wants this session to be very popular. And I think the only way to make this session popular is to let you go to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so we will end it now. You have more chance later. Today.